Hey, Dr. Sia with you. I want to explain what happened with Denmark in their iodine experiment. It's a fascinating, fascinating study, and it shows how the littlest changes of iodine can have huge effects upon thyroid function that go on for some time. Now, Denmark was tracked really closely because they were one of the most recent industrialized nations to fortify their salt with iodine. And they did that because they had a higher rate of goiter, and specifically it was a subtype called toxic multinodular goiter. So let's break that one down. So a uh, nodule, just that, you know, a lump in the thyroid, as opposed to the whole thyroid enlarging. And toxic means not so much that it's going to kill you, but more so that it's, it's emitting unwanted thyroid hormone. So you got that kind of toxic. And multi, there's a bunch of them. So you got these lumps in the thyroid that your body's not asking them to work, but they're pouring out all this extra thyroid hormone, and that's toxic multinodular goiter. And this condition is one, like many, that is especially sensitive to iodine intake. And we see it much more common at the extremes of way too much or way too little iodine. And it's pretty rare outside of those cases. So in the West, for example, adults rarely get this condition, unless they're exposed to a really high dose of iodine, especially before a CT scan or an MRI. But in some parts of the world, they were so low, they had higher rates of it for that reason. And going into this experiment, they had some data from the late 90s. Uh, this, this, the condition probably got to be its worst at about 97. At that point, ironically, I, I double-checked, I wasn't just copying the numbers yet. In 1997, their rate was 97.5 cases per 100,000 people. That was about the worst of it. Prior to then, in 1991, it was about 18 cases per 100,000. And what they thought was, now why did it go up so much over those years? And they weren't sure what the clear reason was, but they thought that iodine fortification would be helpful. So they did, and they tracked it. And after things were all said and done, the rates went down from their peak in 97, but they were still way above their low level in 91. So they went from 18 in 91 to 97 in 97. <laughs> and then uh, by the end of the process, when things had leveled out in the, early, in the early 2000s, they were down to 48. So yeah, not a clear win. And they also found that many other things also affected those goiters, one of which is that genetics were a big part, but also alcohol and smoking were large reasons for that, more so than they thought. But because they were aware of pitfalls, they wanted to look at goiter, but really all types of thyroid disease. And they were so smart, they were so deliberate and cautious in how they went about doing it. So they only they, their intent was to raise the average intake of iodine by about 50 micrograms per day. And there was a lot of thought that went into that. You know, it wasn't like an easy thing to do. So the final, the final tally, what they did was there's a certain type of salt used for Danish rye bread, and they chose to fortify that salt with just enough to get the average intake up by 50 micrograms. And so many Danes have the Danish rye bread on a daily basis, that seemed like a really predictable, controllable way to do that. Now, they did a lot of monitoring to see how this would affect people. So they did this in three different ways. In the first one, they took a group of people in different areas that had different amounts of iodine going into it. So some areas were lower than others. And they were then compared to a similar group, uh, to similar groups after fortification had stabilized and each year during fortification. What they also did was they looked at the overall rates of all types of thyroid disease throughout the country and where that was beforehand and how that played out in the following years. And this was done with over 550,000 people living in those same areas. And the last step they did was they took a group of people that were tracked prior to this and compared them against a similar group after fortification to see what was different. If you've got, you know, a group of 50,000 women who were 45 years of age with these health characteristics, you know, how common is thyroid disease? And then now we're going to jump ahead five years later and see how would that be in that same group now after fortification. So they looked at it in all those ways. And what was useful is that, you know, they have a socialized medical system and it's centralized as well. So, you know, push the button, 
they can get numbers on all these rates of various changes. And they looked at that in terms of how often the disease was diagnosed, how much was spent total on various thyroid care, how often prescriptions were made for thyroid medication, how often procedures were done for thyroid, like uptake scans, and how many thyroid surgeries were done. So all those variables were looked at. And they started tracking these three years before fortification, and they continued to 15 years after fortification. So it was ridiculously thorough. And they also did a lot of analysis of the population to see how well this worked, to see if they went up by the desired amount. You know, maybe it was less than that, maybe it was too much. Yeah, it was all looked at. And again, 50 micrograms. Now, by and large, they nailed their target. You know, the average intake went up by pretty much 50 micrograms. They did it really well. They achieved exactly what they wanted to do. And I've, I've had often conversations with people where I ask them about, you know, they're struggling with their thyroid, and I ask them, well, do you take a multi that has iodine? And someone will say, well, yeah, but it only has 75 micrograms. It doesn't have that much. Well, okay, <laughs> so here's 50 micrograms. So how does 50 micrograms affect a group of people? Well, for the following 15 years after fortification, we saw increases in hypothyroidism, autoimmune Hashimoto's thyroiditis, pediatric hyperthyroidism, thyroid surgery, prescriptions for thyroid medication, spending on all-cause thyroid treatment per capita, and also thyroid cancers. So here's some dramatic numbers. In the first three years alone, prescription medication for thyroid disease shot up by 42%. So the rates of hypothyroidism went up dramatically above the baseline. And that, it was worse at first, but it kept staying there. It never really got better. So for as many as 15 years afterwards, it continued to progress. There's an image I'll share with you showing the rates of thyroid hormone replacement therapy. And you can see that in the years before fortification, right on the year of fortification, and then every year after how it kept on going up. So autoimmune thyroid disease specifically went up by 53%. And yeah, nonspecific hyperthyroidism went up by 49%. Uh, papillary thyroid cancer amongst women, it roughly doubled in that first decade after iodine fortification. So that was a big shift too. And the thing that I really want you to hear is that they weren't overdosed on iodine. You know, they weren't given massive amounts. They never really ended up being at an inappropriate level. And that's what's so shocking. And we've seen that even these subtle changes can lead to huge, huge effects. And they also looked at, with hypothyroidism, how does that affect other facets of health? And what they saw was that as thyroid function slowed down in the population, weight went up. So there was about an average of 8.8 .8 pounds of weight gain in those that had even subtle changes in thyroid function. And they also show that there were secondary blood pressure elevations amongst those same people. So even, even those that didn't get overt full-on thyroid disease, when their TSH levels got to be suboptimal, they started to gain weight, they started getting higher blood pressure. What they also saw was that in the past, Denmark had a tendency to see stronger thyroid function with age. Like TSH scores would get a little bit lower for people each decade of life. Now again, some would get toxic multinodular goiter and it would go far too low, but in general, most people were not lapsing into hypothyroidism like they do in the West. Here, high TSH scores get more common with age. In the past in Denmark, it was the opposite. The TSH scores stayed stable or they drifted down slightly. But after iodine fortification, the opposite happened. We started seeing gradual increases in TSH that correlated with age. And this was, this was common. So it was a complete shift. So what are the things we can learn from this? Well, what we learned from Denmark was that before and after iodine fortification, the lowest rates of thyroid disease were in populations that were about 50 to 100 micrograms per day of iodine. Now, in general, most people can safely consume up to about 200, but if you're struggling with thyroid disease, being a little lower than that is where things often get better, and the study confirmed that. We also saw that changes, not, not just the excess or the deficiency, but changes as little as 50 micrograms 
can precipitate thyroid disease. We also saw that goiter is more common with iodine excess and severe iodine deficiency, but even those minor excesses can trigger it. And they also learned that goiter was more strongly affected by alcohol, tobacco, and genetics, that the iodine alone didn't make a great difference on correcting it, but it did raise the cost per capita for treatment of thyroid disease. More people were being treated. There was more expenses that the government as a whole was spending. And thyroid cancers, hypothyroidism, autoimmune thyroid disease, these things all went up and they've continued to remain elevated. So little bits make a big difference. And Denmark taught us a lot. We got massive amounts of data from their experience. All right, take great care. I'll see you again real soon.